Holy moly. So here we are still in diversity month. What was it? Unity and diversity was the unity and diversity. Something like that. Hmm? Yeah, revealing unity. That was it. I knew I knew it was something unity. Anyway, today is the rainbow life. <clears throat> so I want to talk about that. In 1978, San Francisco artist and gay activist Gilbert Baker raised the iconic rainbow flag for the very first time. And every strip of fabric was dyed by Baker's own hands and stitched together by volunteers. And the eight colored stripes, there were eight colored stripes originally. <clears throat> Hot pink was at the top. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> Hot pink for sexuality, red for life, orange for healing, yellow for sunshine, green for earth, turquoise for the arts, indigo for harmony, and violet for spirit. But what about the history of the rainbow flag? Certainly it just didn't appear in 1978, right? It has a really long history. You know, it was first sewn and flown in the 1480s during the Protestant Reformation. A German religious reformer named Thomas, Thomas Munzer is often depicted in paintings carrying the rainbow flag, using it as a symbol for the gospel of social change that he was calling for. And then, and then in the uh, 1500s, the German Peasant War carried it into battle. And after some um, experiments with different types of flags, the first rainbow flag was in 1924, adopted as the official symbol for the international cooperative movement. And that was in Great Britain. Italy and Greece both use the rainbow flag to symbolize peace. And the rainbow flag is uh, the official flag of Cusco, Peru. I think it's a territory in Peru. And I know in the late 60s and early 70s, the rainbow flag was used by sailboat enthusiasts on the East Coast. And we would fly it when in port to symbolize happy hour had begun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. Yes. And that people were welcome along, you know, welcome on board. I think now they use it with a black, a black outline of a martini glass. <laughs> but anyway, it used to be, it used to be the rainbow flag. Oh, anyway, the rainbow is a meteor, meteorological phenomenon caused by reflection, refraction, and dispersion of light through water droplets, resulting in the spectrum that we see in the sky. Also, when we, when we shine white light through a prism, it is separated into its component parts that we can see. It's only a very small spectrum of light, but the ones we can see, red, orange, yellow. You remember this from grade school? Roy G. Biv, right? Roy G. Biv, you know that guy. <laughs> red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. The separation of the visible light spectrum known as dispersion. The entire electromagnetic light spectrum begins at low frequency, or very long wavelength, <coughs> and, and the, that end, I think, yes, is radio waves, microwaves, then it goes to infrared, then there's the visible light spectrum, the little bit that we can see, then there's ultraviolet, then there's x-rays, and then there's gamma rays. So it goes, it goes long in both directions. So we only see just this little part. But, but I bring that all up to talk about the rainbow life. And the rainbow life is us. You know, I mean, look around the room. I mean, you talk about refracting into all different colors. Look at us. We are all different colors. We're that. We are that. The rainbow life is us. We make up the rainbow. We are all colors of the visible light spectrum. We are all ethnicities, all religions, or no religion, all hair color, eye color. All heights, all weights, all abilities, all languages, all, all gender identities, all senses of humor or none. You know those people. They're not us. <laughs> right? We span this range, like the radio waves. We span the range from radio waves to gamma rays and everything in between. And that's the great thing about us, is that, that we're all individualized. 
We're all individual. Our spirit has seen fit to incarnate as each one of us. And you've never been before and you'll never be again. And isn't that the wonder and the marvel and the, and the miracle of each one of us? Let me tell you about, about me. <laughs> I was born a sinner. <laughs> Here it is. I was, it was beyond my control. It was nothing I could change. I was born this way. My parents knew it at a very early age. And they tried to help accept me for what I was. My teachers in elementary school, however, they tried to change me, forced me to identify with the majority. My grandmother on my mother's side reassured my mother, though, since she had a daughter like me, too, my, my Aunt Terry. And it was not until President Kennedy signed a bill live on television, was it okay to be left-handed? And so I know it sounds weird, but in those days, I was looked upon as if there was something wrong with me. I was called wrong-handed. Right? You guys were right-handed, so clearly I was wrong-handed. You know, if you were right, then I must be wrong. <laughs> Ernest Holmes said this. He said, we will never arrive until we arrive at the level where our state is not exclusion but inclusion. The greatest life is the one that includes the most joy, the most friendship, the most love, the most play, the most harmony, the most of God. God is not exclusive of anything. We're all, we're all invited. We're all in. We're there already. We are already that thing that we seek. And that's the rainbow life I'm talking about. Everything is included. Nothing is excluded. It's inclusive of all life. Every color, every energy, every, every life, everything is included. And that's the allness of spirit. God is all there is and we are one with that. That's core concept one, right there. God is all there is, we are one with that. That is the first concept of the science of mind and spirit. Hmm. Ernest Holmes said, in the manifest universe, we see diversity, multiplicity. No two people are alike. No two blades of grass, no two grains of sand, no two flakes of snow, no two drops of water. None are alike. And yet all merged into this one eternal unity. Therefore, we see the first principle of life is oneness. The first performance of life is multiplying itself without dividing itself. Consequently, we are one, even while we are many. And since each of us is some part of the whole, if we seek to destroy each other, we only ultimately hurt ourselves. This is the great lesson of life. So there is no other. There is no out there, out there. And haven't we been learning this lesson over and over and over and over and over again throughout humanity? You know, in, in war, there is other. You know, in exclusion, there is other. These ideas of separation and exclusion. We hear it in talks. We see it in movies. It's like it's all around us, this idea that there's an us and a them. There is no them. There is only an us. And, and, and yet, some of us know that. We come to teachings like this. We come to places like this. And we know that it doesn't matter. We, it's not that we don't see the differences. It's that we celebrate them. We celebrate them. We are all different. I mean, just look around this room. You should see yourselves. You should come up here one by one and just look. Look at all the different skin tones and hair colors and eye colors and, and sizes and shapes. And we are so beautifully different. And yet what we know is there is one life. There is one life. It is God's life. And when we remember it and when we awaken to it, we see it everywhere. We see spirit everywhere. The, um, I don't know if anybody has seen that new movie yet, Black Panther. Anybody? Yeah, okay. Yay. Anybody see Black Panther yet? So the main character in the movie says, in times of crisis, 
Wise men build bridges while the foolish build barriers. We must find a way to look after one another as if we were one single tribe. Because we are. We are. We are humans. Right? We're, you know, it's like, you know those little, the, I don't know, those, census, those census forms, you know, you have to fill out every 10 years and it asks for your ethnicity, you know, and it's like this color, that color, this color, that color. And then at the bottom it says other, I always check other. And with, on the line, when it says race, right, all these listed, and then at the bottom I check other and the line and I write human. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what we are. You know, there's only one race, it's the human race. That's who we are. We are one single tribe. <laughs> There's only one race, the human race. We are that, and we are the rainbow tribe. That's who we are. We are all together. We are all one, all human. Ernest Holmes said this in, uh, a long time ago, 1956. He said, we shall have to find a faith for every fear, and we shall have to find a hope for every despair. And we shall have to find a sense of inclusion whenever we have felt excluded. We will have to have a love that covers everything that seems to be hate or dislike or disdain and find ourselves and companionship and the company of some inner presence and some overdwelling or indwelling reality which is greater than we are. And that's what we happen to call God. And he says, every race, every age, every religion has had a name for this, and it doesn't matter what the name is. A rose by any other name would still smell as sweet. We must have a sense of the overshadowing and the indwelling presence. And I think we have to feel that the God who is round about is also within, the divine spirit within us. And then we shall have to begin to speak in an affirmative language. So that's what we're about. That's what we are. That's who we are. We are the beloved's own. We are the outpicturing of this one energy that knows of itself in form because we are that. And everything else in the manifest universe is that. It is an energy that has sought to know of itself in the physical world. And, and here we are. <laughs> and here we are, and here we've done it. So my dear ones, we must let the separation fall from our eyes and know the affirmation of oneness. We must see the divine in each other, always. We must look in each other's eyes and see God looking back. We must know that the divine is alive and well in each one of us. And we could never fight. We could never war. We could never even disagree when we know God is looking back. Ernest Holmes said this, and I love it, and this is, this is one I have hanging up, you know. <laughs> we cannot only embrace ourselves. Somehow our arms must find themselves around the shoulders of all of humanity. We cannot worship a God that belongs to us alone. Only as we enter into a feeling of the essence that diffuses itself everywhere, then, at last, we can look at each other and say, I worship God in your form. Thank you so much. <laughs>